The world is divided into four spheres, each sphere divided among continents and nations. Nations are divided by borders and interests. These interests divide the news. We examine the impact of these divisions on people and power. This is Imaginary Minds. Welcome to the program. I'm your host, Michael Fox. On April 19th, Baltimore City Police killed a 24-year-old unarmed black man named Freddie Gray. His death kicked off weeks of protests and the latest round of the larger Black Lives Matter movement, which has exploded across the United States against racism and police brutality. I'll speak with Reverend Heber Brown III, a pastor and a community activist in North Baltimore, about Black Lives Matter, the Baltimore uprising, and where it may be headed. But first, a look at media and Latin America. The forced disappearance of the 43 students from the Ayotzinapa Teachers Training College in Mexico took place more than seven months ago. Despite the fact that Mexico was witness to some of the largest mobilizations in recent history demanding justice for the abducted students, the issue has largely fallen off the radar. Parents of the students are currently touring North America and Europe in an effort to keep the issue in the headlines but their efforts have been met with indifference from the international media. This is nothing new for Mexico. The media routinely ignores issues that generate bad press for corrupt elites. A case in point is a recent independent report published by Laura Castellanos alleging that the Mexican Federal Police massacred 16 unarmed people in Apatzingan in the Mexican state of Michoacan. According to witness testimonies, authorities engaged in execution-style killings of people on their knees with their hands in the air. These events were also underreported in the international press. And then there's the case of Tlatlaya, where 22 people were massacred by government troops in an incident that a working group of the Mexican Congress called an illegal, excessive, and disproportionate use of force. This too went largely unreported. Clearly, if any one of these events would have happened in a country considered unfriendly to the United States, media condemnations of the atrocities would have been swift and relentless. Yet Mexico, a staunch Washington ally, receives only what can be considered preferential treatment by the global mainstream media. On May 1st, Maryland State Attorney Marilyn J. Mosby announced that six police officers would be criminally charged for the murder of Freddie Gray, a 25-year-old unarmed black man killed in mid-April. The announcement came after weeks of protests rocked Baltimore City. After a particularly violent day of demonstrations in late April, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake instituted a citywide curfew and called for the occupation of the city by the National Guard. The mainstream media labeled the protesters thugs and denounced the demonstrations for violence. However, many Baltimore residents urged the public to consider why the protests were taking place, not how. Reverend Heber Brown III serves as pastor of Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in North Baltimore. He's worked alongside a variety of community organizations that address issues such as homelessness, poverty, racism, workers' rights, and social justice. He's also a member of Baltimore United for Change, a coalition of concerned citizens and organizations working for justice in Baltimore City. Reverend Heber Brown III, welcome to Imaginary Lines. Thank you so much. Can you speak to the structural causes in Baltimore City that have led up to this particular moment? Yes, here in Baltimore, uh, we have all of the, the ingredients of a perfect storm that help to give uh, the world a, a look into great anger and angst about social conditions here. So, for example, in Baltimore, one out of every four black people here live in a food desert and don't have strong access to healthy food options. Uh, here in Baltimore, you have a city school system that uh, perennially struggles with financing and funding issues. There's lead in the water, lead in the pipes of the city school system. And so the children can't even drink the water from the water fountains in their schools. You have strong and concentrated uh, uh, problems with gentrification. And so from East Baltimore to West Baltimore, you have entire black communities that are uprooted and displaced to God knows where. Uh, then of course you have rampant police brutality and lack of transparency where we have a long list of names and situations where people have been killed, people have been brutalized, and no one's been held accountable for the murders of these per persons or the beatings of these persons. And so while the world knows the name of Freddie Gray, 
There's a very long list of other names of people who we know here in Baltimore have gone through similar nightmares. As you said, there's a long list of names that have gone through similar nightmares. Why now? What does this moment mean for Baltimore and the larger Black Lives Matter movement? I think that trade winds are blowing across the country, um, that all over you have uh, hashtags and names of people who have been killed by the police and no one's been held accountable. I think technology also plays a part in this, that while we understand that this has long been going on, uh, now with technology, we're able to help to bubble stories up from the bottom as opposed to waiting for corporate media to uh, trickle them down from the top. And so we're informing one another, we're organizing each other, and we're watching as this unfolds in other places. Um, we watched it when Ferguson erupted and the people rose up in an uprising there. We watched for Oakland. We watched for New York. And now in Baltimore, others are watching us. And I think a part of that is people are getting sensitized uh, to the pervasiveness of this issue and are readying themselves for when the wind will blow in their direction to grab it and take advantage of the opportunity to make that structural change that you talked about. What is your analysis of the corporate media coverage of the protests, the marches, and the overall uprising? Well, you know what? I'm wary of those uh, who have far more concern with our uh, expression uh, to uh, our pain uh, than they are to the condition of our suffering. And people have been suffering for a very long time, but the corporate media uh, has been focusing so much on broken bottles and burned out cop cars that it's missing the real story. They're so focused on how we're crying that they're missing why we're crying. It's not about a messed up baseball game. It's not about a restaurant that the window was busted out. There's a black man dead named Freddie Gray. And Freddie Gray is now not just an individual, he's a symbol of every other black woman, black man, brown woman, brown man, poor people who have been caught up in this web of brutality. Just two weeks ago, WBAL ran an interview with members of rival gangs saying that they have made a truce in an effort to stop the violence. Is that happening on the ground? Well, I think that our street organizations have in different times uh, establish relationships and truces on their own in less recognizable ways. Uh, because of the focus of the media right now, this one becomes a little different because uh, it's more public uh, and it's out there in the forefront, but it's also an intentional act uh, of unity by our brothers and sisters in the street organizations to go against this false narrative that was put out and report, false report put out by the Baltimore City Police Department saying that the gangs, quote unquote, were coming together to off police officers. I can tell you from a fact from right here on the ground in Baltimore that the minute that the police said that the gangs were coming together to off a police officer was the very minute that people on our team were saying uh, that they were, they were receiving calls from members of the Bloods and the Crips and the Black Gorilla family saying that is absolutely not true and we are standing against that. They're putting our people in danger. And so I, I want everybody to know that yesterday we were standing shoulder to shoulder with our sisters and brothers in the street organizations. I want to let you know that we are partners in protecting our community uh, and we are partners in making sure that we get through this together. Everybody's leading in this coalition, in this campaign, and we're glad to be working together. Baltimore has a long history of organizing and there are a lot of people coming together right now. Where do you think this moment of unity, organizing and action can go? We're really thankful for those partners who are coming to Baltimore, recognizing that local voices and local activists and organizers uh, need to be at the forefront of all of this. Uh, and so coming to Baltimore to create a stage for oneself or uh, to get their 15 seconds of fame in national media, uh, we don't play like, like that. This is not Ferguson, it's not Oakland, it's not New York, this is Baltimore. And so we don't know you, uh, the world don't know real quick that we don't know you. Thankfully. Uh, the partners who have been coming have come in the spirit of true partnership and solidarity, and for that we're glad. Thank you, Reverend Heber Brown III, for joining me on Imaginary Lines. Thank you so much. President Long shot, spoiler, unrepresentative. These are just some of the words being used by media outlets to describe the independent U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders, who announced on April 30th that he would seek the presidential nomination of the Democratic Party. 
The race to choose the Democratic Party's candidate for the 2016 elections has barely begun, and the left-leaning Sanders is already being written off, with media coverage of his announcement receiving a fraction of the attention that surrounded Hillary Clinton's decision to run. This lack of coverage comes despite the fact that Sanders has a long history of winning as an underdog, and the fact that he successfully raised 1.5 million U.S. dollars on the first day of his campaign. Sanders is uncompromising about his political reputation, and he launched his campaign calling for a, quote, political revolution against the billionaire class. This stance would almost certainly lead to the Vermont senator's marginalization by the mainstream media. Sanders is aware of this reality and even made a direct plea to the press. I ask the media's help, he said, allow us to discuss the important issues facing the American people. But the self-described socialist also warned the press not to underestimate his chances. Perhaps they would be wise to heed his words. A debate is stirring within the U.S. working class, and Sanders may be just the guy singing their tune. That's it for today's program. Thanks for watching the show. I'm your host, Michael Fox. Please join me next week.